Hey, you guys. Welcome to our first session of the I Believe um, Ion Mental Health mini webinar or mini yeah, I guess mini webinar is a good way for it. Um, so first up, we have our 9 a.m. session, Getting Your Passion Back, Turning Your Talents into Healing. Our speakers are Kathy Ducey and Wendy Carpenter. So let me just introduce these guys before we bring them on stage. Uh, first up, Kathy Ducey was previously the host of ESPN's Sidelines and worked at NBC. When Kathy and Steve got married and the kids came along, Kathy retired from her TV work to raise the family and preside as the Ducey family CEO, and CFO, and she's enjoyed every single minute of it. Regarding the Happy Cookbook, which you may have seen on Amazon or on the shelf at your local bookstore, the year before we started this project, Kathy was diagnosed with ocular melanoma, an unbelievably rare and aggressive form of eye cancer. She was lucky that they caught it early and she was treated by Dr. Carol Shields and her team of specialists at the Wills Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. During her first examination, Dr. Shields told Kathy, I'm going to save your life, and she did. Wendy is a four-year ocular melanoma survivor. Uh, originally diagnosed with a small tumor in 2018 in December, she was treated with proton beam therapy uh, at Seattle Cancer Care. Unfortunately, her tumor had a mind of its own and decided it wasn't quite done growing. And in August of 2020, Wendy had her eye um, removed and began her monocular journey. As of January 23, um, January 2023, currently, she remains no evidence of disease. Insert happy dance is what she says. <laughs> Wendy is passionate about supporting newly diagnosed ocular melanoma patients, connecting with them um, and helping them find helpful resources as they begin their journey and encouraging them to prioritize their mental health. Let's bring them on the screen. Welcome, you guys. Hello. Thank you so much for being here with us. Hi, Danae. How are you guys? Good, good. Nice and bright and good. early for you, I know. It's nice and bright and early for me too. Yes. <laughs> and nice Kathy, to see you again. Yeah, so good to see you. Kathy, where are you from uh, right now? Are you with your daughter right now? No, I'm in Jupiter, Florida. We're, okay. we're on baby watch. Uh, my daughter-in-law's due any day and my, my daughter's due in a couple of weeks. Very fun. So exciting. Very um, well, okay, so I was going to have you guys just kind of briefly tell your stories and talk to us um, about some of the things that you have experienced uh, throughout your diagnosis and some of the talents or the hobbies that you've had that you've kind of either refused to give up or that you've started as a result of just wanting to face up to some new challenges, you know. Um, so do you guys have a preference as to who goes first? You go ahead, Wendy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Danae, is it okay? I did do, I put some little pictures on slides, if that's yeah, okay. That's totally um, fine. If you just pull those up and screen share and say that you're sharing your screen, then Paige in production will be able to pull those up and she'll cast them up for the rest of the group to see. Okay. And I think they're up. There we go. Um, I know I, um, you know, in the intro, Danae, hi, everybody. Sorry, let me back up. Hi, I'm Wendy. Um, Danae obviously introduced me, um, and so I won't go through this, um, but I just, I love, so my hobby is photography, um, and I got into photography, gosh, probably in about, probably about 2010, 2011, my dad was a, loved, loved photography, like natural, you know, wildlife photography, and he gave me one of his cameras and then it just kind of went on from there. Um, but what I want to do is I want to go back to even before my diagnosis really quick, because I, as I was preparing for this, it really occurred to me, um, you know, what all started this. So I have a, a picture of me um, up there in the very, um, from back in 2017. 2017 is actually when the Nevis was discovered in my eye. And at that time, I had been having all kinds of health issues. Um, and I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, um, sl severe sleep apnea, um, and then also an autoimmune disease, um, Hashimoto's. So I just had a lot. I was super unhealthy. Um, at that point, um, I was um, 330, about 330 pounds, um, very very unhealthy, both physically and mentally. Um, and one of the last things I did was a co was went and got an eye exam. 
um, in that time frame because my coworker was like, oh, you're squinting. And I'm like, no, I'm fine. I have 20-20 vision, which I did still have 20-20 vision. But I went in for that appointment and that's when they discovered what they thought was a benign nevus. Um, and everyone thought it was benign because it had drusen. It didn't have any leaking fluid. It was pretty flat. So um, anyway, I was, re you know, referred and went, and that's where it really started my whole journey. Um, but I, I say that because I look at that, at that version of myself and I'm so thankful that um, I had the opportunity to get gastric bypass, which is a weight loss surgery. And in from, I, I actually had the surgery in, in February of 2018. And so from that time, I, from February, 2018 to when I was diagnosed in December of 2018, I actually had lost 160 pounds, which is a lot. Um, but also I had spent so much time on my mental health in that time period and really going into this diagnosis, I was kind of like a new version of me really just beginning my mental health journey. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. There's just some other pictures of, you know, when I went, like I had the proton beam and then um, I love to kind of bring some joy to a really dark situation. And so I had this, I bought, I found this shirt that said walk the plank that I wore the day before my enucleation. Um, and then I also wore it to appointments um, shortly after. So um, anyway, that is that I'm going to go ahead and go to my next slide, maybe. Um, so I wanted to get into just a little bit about my hobby and so these are some photos um, that I took before my diagnosis. Um, I, I really focused on just more portrait photography. Um, these are my, my nephew in the upper left-hand corner, one of my dear friends who has a, a business. Uh, this was like her headshot for her business page. Um, and that is actually um, one of the last portrait photos that I did um, that was taken, those photos were taken three days before I found out about my recurrence. Um, and kind of once, and that kind of stopped me using my, I call this my big fancy camera. Um, and just lots of just pe people's kids, families. I loved capturing just natural moments. Um, the picture in the middle of my friend's daughter blowing that was she was just sitting there and I just snapped that photo. And I, it's just one of my favorite all time photos. Um, the thing that was interesting to me that as I was preparing for this um, was that I found that I, I had done some, you know, um, wildlife photography and sunset photography with my big camera. Um, I, that wasn't a lot. That wasn't my focus back then. And so um that's a, sorry, but that, that was before my, um, before my surgery. Once I had a nucleation, I quickly learned I couldn't take pictures the way I wanted to anymore. I couldn't see through the viewfinder. It was just, I, it was really, really challenging. And I went through this period of like really deep sadness, um, that I couldn't do that, do that anymore. And so, you know, I still loved, I still loved photography. I still loved capturing things, but my focus really changed on kind of what I was taking pictures of. Um, I switched over to my iPhone and then I actually upgraded to one of the higher end iPhones. Um, and I started taking pictures of sunsets and, and, I loved just the hope that a sunset brings, the beauty, the peace. Um, and so I really found myself taking a lot of photos of sunsets, the ocean. Um, I actually moved to the ocean for um, 2021. I lived at the Oregon coast. So I was able to go to the ocean and capture sunsets all the time. Um, and so I'm going to switch to my next like view of pictures. So these 
are all pictures that I took basically in 2021. Um, they're mostly all taken while I was living over at the coast. And as you can see, lots of sunsets, lots of pink, purples, reds, um, some, you know, lighthouses mixed in there. Um, but I, I, when I, I love these photos, they just make me, they bring me so much joy. Um, and I loved creating them. I actually recently just framed a few, um, that are in my house. I had never framed them before. Um, and from this, I want to just, um, talk to you guys about two photos here that just really, um, they have like kind of fun stories behind them. So the first one is this picture on the rock. This is Four Brothers. Um, it's an area in Lincoln City, Oregon. Beautiful. If you ever get the opportunity to go there, can't miss it. It's basically four rocks um, with this one rock has this tree that's just growing out of the side of these rocks. And um, I'd always loved it um, driving by, but I got really up close and personal with it. I took my kayak out and went over, pulled my boat, my kayak up, got out, and I was taking these photos. I mean, a beautiful sunset. Just, I, I loved it. And I was like, I hope I'm getting this. Um, I hope I'm capturing this right. And then I turned around and my boat, my kayak was gone. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know where my kayak is. And then I see it had floated off because the tide came in and I wasn't prepared for that. So... I jump in the water and I'm running and I'm praying that I'm not going to fall. My, I was worried my eye was going to fall out while I was running. Um, and yeah, so I, I got to my boat, everything was fine. Um, I paddled back to the shore and it all was good. And then when I got home and I looked at this photo, I was like, it was so worth it. I, this is one of my all time favorite photos. Um, and then the next photo is a photo that I took um, at a, another Oregon beach, obviously, um, called Mulak. Um, and this one was like a really big challenge for me because you had to kind of walk down this really steep, like it was kind of a washed out little trail to get down there. And I made it down and um, with my walking sticks very carefully, because at this point, I still was a little uneasy, like only being able to see out of one eye. So I made it down. And again, just it was a beautiful sunset. I loved the beach. My word for 2021 was hope. And I decided to write hope in the sand. And then I went back up and shot this image of it. And again, it's just one of my favorite pictures. It speaks to me. It's peaceful. It's, um, you know, it's beautiful and it, I look at it and it brings me hope. So that is um, my journey up until then. I still had this deep desire um, to try and get my camera out again. And so as I was on the Oregon coast, really healing, you know, from my journey so far, I decided to I decided one day that I was going to pick up my, my big fancy camera again, and I was going to try it and just see, and my friends were in town. Um, we went on this walk and um, I'm going to switch to the next slide here. Sorry. Um, went to, went to the, went on this walk and I, um, I snapped this photo here and, um, and this, I mean, this is my first photo of, um, that I took with my, with my big fancy camera again. And I remember reaching out to Danae afterwards and like, or like sharing it on my social media. I can't remember, but just, I'm like, oh my gosh, I still have it. I love it. Like, and now I have two things cause I didn't really use my iPhone before. Um, and now I have both. Um, I didn't use my big camera a lot. Um, I mean, I would use it occasionally. Um, but almost a year ago, I moved to Ridgefield, Washington, and I live right outside of a, um, 
my backyard is basically a wetland. And then I live a couple miles from uh, the Ridgefield Natural Wildlife Reserve. And so I love taking my camera and I drive through, um, I drive through and I just capture, you know, animals, wildlife. That's what I capture more of now than people. And it brings me so much peace um, and joy um, doing this. Um, the one, the one photo in the left-hand corner, the owl, that was actually, there was, it was a pair of owls and they were on the tree right outside my balcony um, last June and um, just magnificent um, animals. Um, so beautiful. Um, so yeah. I, so this is kind of my journey of bringing me back to photography, like bringing me back to the big camera. I, photography never left me, but um, for me, when I think about my mental health journey, um, I, prior to my diagnosis, um, I really suffered from depression. But what I learned about myself through my cancer journey is that I actually don't, um, I actually don't have um, depression as much as I had an undiagnosed anxiety. And when my anxiety isn't treated, then it, then it, then it leads to depression. And so I've really spent the last four years learning so much about myself, about what I need to be at peace. Um, I learned that for me asking with my anxiety, I require a lot of questions. I need to answer a lot of questions or sorry, I ask a lot of questions. I need a lot of information for my mind to be at peace. Um, so I think, um, that is that. And yeah, I think Wendy, this was yeah. great. So, and then just the last slide here was this choose joy. That's kind of my mantra for this journey. Um, this little girl screaming, like screaming at, come at me, <laughs> you know, I, I can take you. So yeah. So thank you for that. Thank you for listening. No, no, Wendy, this was, this was marvelous. Thank you so yeah. much for just for sharing and for talking so openly and vulnerably. Um, I just, I want to honor you for, for really, well, thank you for honoring us with, with your courage and your vulnerability. Cause I know, um, it can be, it can be kind of a challenging thing to talk about. Yeah. And, and I totally relate as well to the kind of the undiagnosed anxiety. I think I am far less depressed than I am actually just really anxious. And if it gets really bad and I don't manage that anxiety, then it turns into depression, yeah. which is obviously not great. Nope. Um, but I did want to ask you yeah. before we move yeah. over to Kathy, uh, can you talk to us just like, I guess, tell us a little more, um, let's connect the dots a little yeah. bit. So Tell us how focusing on your hobby um, of photography helped you specifically, you know, to navigate your, di your diagnosis. So what about photography? What about this hobby made it feel so um, like something you wanted to return to, like something that you always came back to and that was really serving you in supporting your mental health? I think it's really grounding for me. It's kind of like my, I view it as my meditation. Meditation doesn't really work for me. Um, I keep trying it, but my brain just keeps spinning and spinning. And um, the photographer really grounds me um, getting out in nature, capturing those images, like looking at the beauty all around me, um, you know, really just, it, yeah, I think it's just really grounding. And it just brings me, it brings me like this sense of peace. It calms the storm in my mind for a few minutes. Um you know, because how can you not look at a little bunny eating grass and not be happy and think that everything's wonderful, you know, so it just, it just really, it just helps along in that way, I guess. I, I don't know. No, I, I think that's great. And I, I just wanted to help people yeah. kind of connect that out no. that, you know, whatever, whatever kind of hobby you have that you um, either pick up and continue doing after your diagnosis or something that you start maybe as a result, because you're willing to try something new, um, whatever it ends up being, there's going to be things about it that are helpful to you. Like, like I know, um, like I play, I play piano. And so when I play piano and I like, full disclosure, I have not played very much recently, but when I do, and the times that I've been really anxious, it's something that helps to bring 
bring my anxiety levels down because it is something that I think changes my state. It changes how I feel. It changes the vibrations that I'm feeling. For me, music is one of those big things. Um, but I think just recognizing that a hobby or um, something, a passion that you love, it can be healing to make sure that you turn to that um, because of how it grounds you, it brings you peace. Um, it helps you to stay calm or, you know, whatever it is. And it can look, it can look like really anything for anyone. Um, I think some people, it might be sports. It might be, it might be running. It might be walking, uh, maybe hiking, but I love, um, I think the picture you took, the one that you sent. And I think it was, like you said, I think it was one I saw on social media and I was like, can I have this in my house? No, and I never uh, got it. Too. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's beautiful. Um, but just seeing that and then now knowing the story behind it of knowing that this was your very first photo that you took on that, that large kind of bigger, fancy camera. It's astounding to me. Like, obviously like you, your gift exists, whether or not you have two eyes or not your gift, your talent, it still exists. And I think what a beautiful thing that you've been able to, you know, to recognize that and to see that evolve over time and to just kind of gain confidence in your other eye in being able to still view this and kind of see through the lens, so to speak, and still capture the same beautiful things. Yeah. No, it is. It's really, um, that photo, that photo is like one of those, you know, I think about inside out the Disney movie, you know, it's like one of those little memory, you know, it's like one of those little memory things. Yes. A core memory. A core memory, um, that really stands out. One other thing I'll just add one thing that I started right before my enucleation was stand up paddle boarding. Um, and I was so afraid that I wasn't going to be able to do that anymore because I, being on the water, I do not like to be in the water, but being on the water is so incredibly grounding for me. It's like photography. And so shortly after my nucleation, three weeks after my nucleation was the end of September. And I'm like, can I just try to get on the paddleboard one more time? And my oncologist told me I could do it as long as I was very careful, kept my eyes covered. Um, and so I did, and I'm like, yes, I can still do this. <laughs> well, and I think that's, that's such a powerful thing to be able to have things that you love mm -hmm. and to then question, like, I think we go through this process mm -hmm. as patients, like where we, we question, okay, am I still going to be able to do the thing that I love? And then, you know, there's, there's this, this crossroads of, do you challenge that, that fear and, and own up to it or just try it and see how it goes? Or do you not try because the fear of failing is too big? Yeah. And I think that that, that's kind of, that's where, that's where that crossroads happens for us. And there are some things that maybe we're forced to give up, but there are other things that it's a choice. And I think that it, there's so much power in, um, in personally choosing to keep, some of those things that you're passionate about, some of those things that bring you peace and to find ways around it, even if it takes some practice, even if it takes, you know, realigning your balance because paddleboarding with one eye is a little bit funky. <laughs> like, I mean, I've, I've done that. Like, I know it's a little yeah. funky. It feels a little weird and things are, you know, they're just a little bit different feeling, um, but it's still possible. And I think just challenging those, those impossibilities and really finding ways around it can be very, um, very empowering. And I think, it, you know, when we find things that we can control about our diagnosis or when we find things that we can improve, that's one of the things that helps us to feel like, okay, I've got this. Um, and that in turn, I think translates to better mental health. Yeah. Nope. 100. Well, Great. thank you, Danae. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Wendy. And we're going to go ahead and bring Kathy back up on stage so that she can talk a little bit and then we'll bring Wendy back. Um, and if we have any questions for the two of these guys, then we will go ahead and post those questions at the end. So Kathy, um, do you want to briefly tell us a little about your diagnosis story and some of the hobbies and things that you have been a part of or that have been a part of your life? Let me just start by saying Wendy's photographs are beautiful and her journey is amazing. And I really appreciate her telling her story. <clears throat> but I'm Kathy Ducey. Uh, seven years ago, almost seven years ago in March, my husband and I went to see our uh, eye doctor just because we needed a new prescription for sunglasses. And um, after the exam, the doctor said, you know, you've got something. It might be a freckle. It might be a nevus. Um, come back in a month. And within that, when I went back the next month, it had changed colors and grown 
and he sent me to uh, Will's hospital the next day. And I went through a battery of tests that didn't think it was anything. And uh, but at the end of the day, Dr. Shields came in and said, Kathy, you have an ocular melanoma. Uh, you need to have plaque surgery. It's your only choice. And I'm going to save your life. And I was shocked. My husband was with me. He was shocked because I had no symptoms at all. And it was about a week later, I got measured for the plaque that they sew on to the tumor in your eye, shut your eye for uh, five days. And in that five days, my three grown children came to stay with us at the uh, Hilton Garden Inn in Philadelphia. And they were watching TV. And because of the radiation, they had to stay like seven or 10 feet away. And I was thinking while I was laying there that at that point, I didn't know if my cancer had spread, had metastasized. And I was trying to think of what I needed to do to get my affairs in order. And all I kept coming back to was, well, as soon as I get home, I've got to get my recipes together because everybody's got their favorite thing and they're not really written down. I've got the basics. And so when I came home, I started to get my recipes together and I thought, gee, these are the, what do I want? Which, what kind of foods do I want? And what kind of recipes? And all I could think of is the foods that make my family happy, my kids happy. And so I, my husband started to help me and he realized, you know, we might have a book here because everyone has a food that makes them happy. And so that's the first cookbook came about uh, as a distraction and to put the uh, recipes together. And it turned out to be a big hit, a New York Times bestseller. Oh, <laughs> it's my assistant husband. Um, it became a, a big hit because it connected with people and uh, a lot of people liked it and then we wrote another one and then we wrote a third one this last year. Um, and it's kept us busy, kept me busy. Um, the other, I think when you have something to show for it, like Wendy's beautiful pictures at the end of the day, there's something to show for your work and your effort. And I think it was good for my mental health because it was distracting distracted away from, you know, I, I think the hard thing for people that have an issue like ocular melanoma is you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what the end game is. And nobody can tell me, um, no, I, I asked what's next because from the uh, surgery, from the plaque, I have retinal retinopathy and I have, um, issues with the eye. I don't have a lot of vision in the cancer eye. I do still have my eye, but I don't have a lot of vision. So, and when I asked the specialist, uh, what, what's new for me, what, what, what's going to happen next month, next year. And, um, they basically just tell me that I should be glad that I'm alive and I am, but um, and the, the other hobby that I had before the melanoma was needlepoint, which is kind of ironic because now it's so hard to see. But during the pandemic, my goal was to make a Christmas stocking for everyone in the family. And I'm almost done. I have two more to go. Uh, but that's, um, I can only do a little bit at a time because it's so hard to see, but I can kind of count it out because I've done it for so long. But um, but that's where I'm at, and and that'll be something that um, my kids and their spouses will have forever. I think that's. I mean, it's it's another. Like I think I think there's something to be said, and I, I think it was Anne in our I believe mental health or I believe seminar in October. She talked about. 
Um, one of the most powerful things we can do for ourselves in this diagnosis, whether it's the beginning or in the middle of this, just to kind of help kind of just reorient ourselves is to do something that she, I think she called it like a legacy letter or something like that. And it's essentially like picturing what do you want your life legacy to look like? And I think that, that while that can be challenging to confront, like the reality, I think just that we all, it's kind of like you said, it's like, we have this uncertainty, but also like, we all know mortality has an end date. Like we do have an end date, all of us, whether, you know, whatever it's going to look like. And this cancer forces that awareness to be much more um, narrow focused. And we have a lot more focus on, well, what's going to happen because of this cancer. So this idea of like having a legacy and being able to have something that really immortalizes you in some ways, like a book or like needlepoint or photography. Um, and, and even if it's not something super tangible, like that you can hold in your hands, just something that you feel passionately about and that you feel connects you with this idea of leaving a legacy and, um, whether it's because, you know, your legacy is left because as a result of, of passing away from cancer or because you just live a full life and you just leave this amazing legacy of the person that you are and the talents that you have. I think that that is, that is one of the most empowering things that we can do as patients to, um, I guess, take this diagnosis by the reins and just really be the ones, you know, in control, so to speak. That's very true. And while you're speaking, I, I was thinking that, uh, like 10 years ago, I got knocked over by a golden retriever and he broke my kneecap. And I had to have a couple of years worth of surgeries and had to have my knee replaced. But you could see the damage. You could look at it and see it. And oh, you know, I was on crutches and braces and all kinds of things. But you can put your knee up. You, I had different ice machines. You can ice it. You can do things to make it feel better and know that you know, in the end, it was going to be okay. But with your eye, it never goes away. You, you know, the you can never forget that you have an issue. Uh, because unless you close it, <laughs> that's like the only, the only thing there's no escaping the fact that you have a, a visual impairment. Yeah, that's I mean, that's a really good point. And, and that can that can translate into a lot of struggles in so many different ways. I know many of us, many of us have issues with driving, with depth perception. Some of us are a little bit more prone to stumbling because we don't see the curb and, and we trip and we miss it. Um, so I, but I love that, like, I think you kind of alluded to this with the needle point that, that you've taken some of those visual challenges and you've said, okay, like I acknowledge that you're a thing, but also I refuse to let that stop me from doing something that I love. And I think that that that's where kind of our power lies is to, to pick and choose. What are the things that we're willing to sacrifice as a result of a visual impairment, whether it's because we're monocular or because we struggle with, you know, lessened vision in one eye um, and radiation uh, retinopathy, any of the things, the side effects that can happen as a result of plaque or, or proton beam therapy. But I think that that's, that's kind of the, the tipping point is what do we give up willingly and maybe, maybe not willingly, but just because we have to for our safety. Um, and what do we keep because we're willing to figure out a way. And I think finding those things that we can figure out a way to hold on to and to keep doing, to keep learning that can, that can really just, um, provide a distraction. Like you said, it can provide a really a, a healthy distraction. Um, but it also leaves a legacy, I think just in, in how we, we handle ourselves and how we approach this, this life after diagnosis. Very true. Now I live in fear of a curb and, <laughs> and then the, I live in fear of the garage. It's okay. The, um, and especially if, uh, the cement is all the same color, I'm sure I look like a crazy person trying to figure out the step, but you do what you have to do. And stairs are yeah. not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're anyone's friend, no. to be honest. Even even when I had two working eyes, I still felt like st stairs were not my friend. No. Um, so I guess, um, will you just, just to kind of, let's again, bring this back. Um, do you feel like, had you not had this epiphany, I guess, during your hospital stay or your hotel stay with brachytherapy, 
had you not had this thought of, you know, that you wanted to really immortalize your recipes and make sure that you had something that you could leave your children that would remind them of you all the time um, and remind them, like, like you said, of the, the foods that they loved as they were kids, then what do you think could have been different? Um, like, or, or do you think, do you think your diagnosis, um, journey would have looked different from a mental health perspective? I never would have had the idea to write a cookbook. I mean, uh, my family likes my cooking and my husband's cooking, but it never, if it wasn't for, I guess it was an epiphany that day. Um, I never would have thought to organize my recipes. I could, it, it never would have occurred to me. So that is a really positive thing that's come out of the diagnosis and the journey, I guess. No, oh, I think, I think that's, um, that's one of the things that I have found in talking to lots of different um, therapists. And I think that uh, our next speaker, Jen, is going to talk a little about this. But one of the things that I think really defines resilience is, uh, for me, resilience is the choice. It's it's the choice to get back up again. And it, to me, resilience is it's an action almost, like to be resilient. Um, it, it, in, it entails a lot of action on our part. And it means looking at something and, and choosing to see something different. Um, I think there was a, there's a quote somewhere. I'm going to get it wrong. I'm sure, but I've seen it floating around off and on in different groups and on social media. And I love it because it, it says, um, sometimes you have to let go of the story you thought you were going to be living and choose to be in the story that you're living now. And I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit. I think it's a little bit different than that, but it's generally, it's this idea that like, Sometimes we have to choose to find the gifts and to find the good despite all of the challenges. And it, and it doesn't mean, and I think we've talked about this maybe on your podcast episode that'll be coming out soon, but it doesn't mean that the challenges don't exist. It doesn't mean that we don't still have vision loss or that we're not still sad or frustrated or that we don't still wake up and, and face the fact that, okay, I only have one eye today. This is, this is what I have to mentally be aware of. These are all the things I have to accommodate it doesn't change those things, but when we can find the gifts and when we can find some of the good that has come out of this journey, this process, then I think that it kind of, it, it changes the perspective. It changes, um, I'm going to use a photography, I guess, analogy, but it changes how we see through the lens of this diagnosis because it, you know, it, it offers some level of, of some beauty or some, um, some connection that we wouldn't have otherwise made or we wouldn't have otherwise had. That's very true. Very true. Um, let's go ahead and if it's okay, let's go ahead and bring Wendy back on so we can all chat for a minute. Hello again, Wendy. Hi, Kathy. That was so fantastic. Um, I'm going to have to check out the cookbook I have. I, I've been on a cooking journey myself, so i have to check that out. Oh, good. Hello. That was just my alarm. Like, no, no. <laughs> no, you're fine. You guys are all good. Um, so, okay. We had a couple questions come in, or at least we have at least one specifically that's come in. Um, one of them is for you, Kathy. And it says, can you tell us about after you wrote your, fir your first cookbook that obviously was, you know, born in the hospital room, so to speak. Um, after you wrote that first one, what, uh, what inspired you to continue writing more? Because you've now written three cookbooks, right? We have. Uh, it, it, it got such a great reception and people just really liked it and connected with the stories. And it's kind of a memoir with food. And um, my husband did most of the writing and uh, he's a funny guy. And people connected with our family stories and the stories connected with the food. And it just hit a nerve with people. And I think it helped that we weren't professional chefs. We were just like family cooks and people like the yeah, food. just everyday people, everyday people. Oh, I think that's so cool. That's so fun. And I, and I, I need to like get a copy of your cookbook to be honest, so that I can see some of these stories, because I think that that's, that's to me, that's the kind of cooking that is the most fun is when you can read a recipe and also see a little of the story that came with it. Yes. Love that. Um, Wendy, out of curiosity, what type of camera do you use? Um, I use a, it's a Canon. It's a DS, DLSR. I never say it right. Um, my, my originally 
the camera my dad gave me was a Canon 40D, which is, I mean, it's like middle of the road for an amateur. And then because I loved it so much, he and my stepmom, they actually gave me it. I currently use it's Canon 6D, six, the number six with the letter D at the end, um, which is the low end. It's the high end of an amateur um, camera. Um, it's one of the only full frame. And so, yeah, I'm, and yeah, that's, the, that's what I use. So as you were adjusting to using your other eye, cause I think, was it that your the eye that was enucleated, was that your dominant eye? My dominant eye. Yeah. And so as you adjusted to using the other eye, were there any like ways of holding the camera or like, did you just, did you just have to practice times to get used to it? No, I, I think, you know, I tried so many times, not so many, I tried a few times before that, that great photo. And I just was like, I got so discouraged. Cause I, like, I would put my, I would constantly put it up with my, my dominant eye. And then I couldn't, obviously couldn't see. Um, and I couldn't use the viewfinder. A lot of people can shoot without looking through the, through the viewfinder. I, I can't do it the other way. So um, yeah. I, and then that one day I just picked it up and it's like, it just clicked. I mean, it had been almost a year since my enucleation. So I had had a lot of, you know, I'd adjusted to a lot of things, um, already. Um, you know, cause, because for me, my vision was still 2020, almost 2020 when I had my eye removed. And so I, you know, it just kind of was a big shock. And when you learn that that's your dominant eye. <laughs> no, I totally understand that. Yeah. Um, so both of you guys, do you, either of you have any new projects that you're looking forward to, um, to starting, or, um, I guess that's the first question is, do you have any new projects you're looking forward to starting or, you know, things that you are looking forward to doing? Grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's very exciting. Two on the way. So that's our, our focus. But one thing that, um, to follow up with the question about the book, uh, I wanted to make sure that we raised awareness about the ocular melanoma. So my husband talks about it in the books and before the uh, pandemic, we would go on book tours where hundreds of people would show up. And at every event, we encouraged people to get their eyes checked. And uh, because people, if you don't have a symptom and if you don't have an issue with your eyes, you don't think you need to get your eyes checked. And so through the last few years, two people have reached out to us that had uh, melanoma, an ocular melanoma from us encouraging them to uh, get their eyes checked. That's amazing. Cool. So cool. And like for me, um, I actually am looking at getting a, a new lens. Um, I'm actually gonna be renting one to test it out. Um, because out here in, at the wildlife reserve, there are a lot of birders, um, people who love to look at birds. And I want to get a 600 millimeter lens so I can zoom in really, really close and capture, you know, some of the wildlife really close and crystal clear. Um, so that's kind of, that's on my list right now. The other thing that I do for my mental health that is outside of, um, outside of photography is, um, I actually love to build Legos. Um, really? That's so cool. It, it shuts off. It's the only thing I do that shuts off my brain. Um, like completely shuts it off. There's no thought. It's just building the next step. I actually, also actually wasn't planning to do this, but I just finished <gasps> it. Oh, wow. Um, it's Incredible. the book. Incredible. Um, and so I, you know, it's just one of those things. It's, um, what a friend of mine who's a life coach said, find something that brings, that feeds your, your inner child. And that was Legos. So that's the other thing. So I have another, I have a whole nother house to build. <laughs> that's so cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yep. Love that. Well, you guys, both of you, this has been fantastic. I just want to thank you again, both for, for honoring us with, 
with being here and with um, sharing your stories and with helping, I think, just draw some connections for hopefully some other patients. And um, I hope that this can show some some of the patients who may be doubting whether or not they can continue some of these hobbies or these passions that they have, um, just to to really reiterate how important it is that we maintain um, holding on to those things that are the most important. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to say goodbye. But if you guys want to just say farewell, everybody wave. Um, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>